I'll proceed with the, I told you that I was going to go through this converse of the Cauchy theorem. Okay. Uh, so Cauchy theorem says that for every analytic function, uh, if you take any closed contour, in, which is inside the, which is uh, inside the region which is simply connected, where it's analytic, uh, the answer is zero, right? So the Cauchy theorem was that. Was that in some region, if you take uh, some any closed contour, so there is some region here, let's say, in this region, function is analytic, some function is analytic. Okay? Uh, and this region R is simply connected. Then any contour C, which is inside this R, if you integrate this function, so fz dz integral over C, that's equal to zero, right? This was the theorem. Now we'll try to prove the converse of this theorem, okay? Meaning that if a function is given to you, which satisfies this condition, that integral over every closed contour inside some region is uh, zero, then it must be analytic, okay? So this is the converse now. This is the theorem of Morera. Theorem of Morera. Okay. So we are given a, a function f which is continuous, which is continuous, and it satisfies the condition that integral of f dz on any in any uh, con closed contour, this is all closed contour, is equal to zero when C, C is a closed contour in, in, the region, in some region R. Okay. And this should be true for all, all the closed, I mean, so this is, the statement from theory, uh, Morera's theorem is that if this function satisfies this equation, this condition, for all closed contours. So this is, where, so this, for, this is true for all closed contours, all contours C. Hmm? So in other words, I mean, this integral or another integral, uh, take another part, closed part, the, also here it vanishes, also here it vanishes. So all the closed contours should vanish, okay? Then the statement is that, then the, what the theorem of Morera says is then the function must be analytic. Then f is analytic. Okay. This is the main statement. And the proof of this goes uh, in the following way. Um, you see, I mean, what is the, what is the consequence of this? Uh, that, uh, 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 I mean, the in integral of over any closed contour, it vanishes. That means that if I define an uh, integral from, say, some fixed point, let's call it z0, which is inside this region, up to some z, arbitrary z, so he, uh, choose some, say, z0 here. And uh, maybe let me erase this thing so that you can see better. So some z0, some fixed point, fixed z0, and take a z which is an arbitrary point in, in this region, okay? And con uh, construct this integral from zero, uh, z0 zero to z, of this function, f, uh, let's call it z prime, dz prime. I mean, z prime is a dummy index. So choose any path, right? So let me call it gamma, between z0 and z, and integrate this. The statement is that this, I mean, naively you would say that, okay, this will depend, the result will depend on the choice of the path, right? Uh, but it, it's not, because, I mean, if you choose another path, let's say, going from here to here, answer is going to be the same, because the difference between these two will be a closed contour. So let's say this integral minus that integral. When you take minus integral, that means it's the same as changing the orientation, right? But this becomes a closed contour. And we are, we are given the fact that uh, for all the closed contour, it is zero. So what we are saying, the difference between the different paths will be zero, right? So this is independent of the, this, let me call it f of z, right? I mean, generally you would say it's a, it depends on z as well as the choice of the path. But because of this condition, we are saying that actually it does not depend on the choice of the path. It's only a function of z, right? It only depends on this point, not the way you arrive at. Okay. 
So this is some function. Now what we, the idea here is, so what we will now show is that this function is analytic. So we want to. We, so the first step in the proof is that we'll show that this is analytic. Yeah? So let's uh, c compute that. So what is d, uh, df by d? So we want to look at this, z plus delta z minus f of z divided by delta z, and ask the question whether the limit exists or not. Right? This is the basic definition of dif uh, whether it's dif analytic or not. Hmm? So we want to take the limit then, delta z goes to zero, and see and check whether this limit exists. So let's do that. Well, by definition, f of z plus delta z is the same integral, except that this z is replaced by z plus delta z, right? So the numerator, so before taking the limit, before taking the limit, let's just calculate this. This is simply integral z naught to z plus delta z of uh, f z prime dz prime minus z naught, z naught to z of f z prime dz prime divided by delta z. So imagine, so to draw the picture, so let's say, so here is, I chose some path. Anyway, it's independent of the choice of the path. And then let's go to z plus delta z. z plus delta z will be some point here, right? Some other point, I mean nearby point. Delta z is small, so it's a nearby point. Now this also is independent of the choice of the path, so let me choose a convenient path. I will choose the path which is the same, I mean, up to the z, it is the same path as before. And then from z to de, uh, z plus delta z, I just choose a straight path, straight line. Hmm? Just a convenient, because anyway, it's all independent of the choice of path. So you might as well choose some convenient path. Hmm? Now, if you consider such a path, you see, this part of the integral from z naught to z will cancel between the two, right? Because after all, this integral is also going from z naught to z, and then z to z plus delta z. So this part of the integral is common to both. Hmm? So they will cancel, and the result will be simply the integral from z to delta z plus delta z of f z prime dz prime divided by delta z. Right? That's what this becomes. Yeah. I mean, what, what is this integral? Z naught to z plus delta z. Uh, this integral, I'm, I'm, I'm taking this path, eh? this path. So this is the same as going from z naught up to z, and then from z up to z plus delta z. Right? So what I'm saying is this part of the integral will cancel with that, right? And then what is left over is just that. All right. So so now what we do. So let me write the numerator as, I mean, so add and subtract f of z, okay, plus f of z, and uh, dz prime, z to z plus delta z, okay? And just added and subtracted. I mean, there's a one over delta z outside. Just added and subtracted this f of z. Okay, nothing happens. Huh? Now let's look at first. Let's look at this one. This is depends on z. Whereas the integration variable is z prime, so I can take this out of the integral. So this term simply gives me f of z, and then there's a one over delta z, and the integral of z prime from z to z, z plus delta z. But that simply gives me delta z, right? I mean, you you remember that uh, we we made we said this uh, this integration. Um, uh, satisfy the usual property d of any any uh, function, let's say dh, dh by dz. I mean, where this function, I mean, this differential makes sense, which means h is analytic. Hmm? dz uh, prime, let's say, between any two points. So let's say z naught to z one. This is simply equal to h of z one minus h of z zero. Right? Remember, I mentioned. It satisfies the usual, usual definitions of the integral. If it's a total derivative, then the result of the integral will be simply the endpoints, contribution from the endpoints. So now look at this here, dz prime. This is a total derivative after all, right? So it's just going to give me the limits of the z prime, the value of z prime, 
at z plus delta z minus the value of z prime at z, which is simply delta z. Okay. So this is, uh, I mean, this gives me z plus delta z minus z, the two limits. So z z cancels, delta z cancels. So this term simply gives me f of z. Hmm? Now let's look at this term. So uh, again, uh, so this is f z. So let's look at now uh, the second term here, uh, the first term here. And for the first term, what we will do is we will, uh, uh, I mean, we will take the, use the Darbu inequality. Let's use the Darbu inequality. Okay, which says that this, this, so one over delta z. So let's take the absolute value of this this object. Uh, f of z prime minus f of z dz prime. If you take the absolute value, then Darbu inequality says that that's the same as. I mean, less than or equal to is less than or equal to absolute value of one over delta z. I mean, that is this this thing, and then the absolute value of that, which is by Darbu inequality, is uh, less than or equal to the maximum value of f z prime minus f z, the maximum value, times the length of the arc, length of the path. But the length of the path, you see, I am taking the straight path from z to z plus delta z. Is simply the length delta z, right? So this gives me the length over the path is simply again delta z. So these two cancel. So what we are seeing is that the absolute value of this quantity is less than or equal to the maximum value of f z prime minus f z, where what is z prime? Z prime is at arbitrary points on this this small path, right? So since f is continuous, it is clear that when delta z goes to zero the value of f z prime will become arbitrarily close to f of z because it's continuous. So this will go to zero in the limit delta z goes to zero. This is where I'm using continuity, right? Of course, I use continuity anyway in the, even the fact that I'm able to integrate it, right? So I've already used continuity. So therefore, this goes to zero. This result goes to zero in the limit in delta z going to zero limit and because of continuity because f is, is supposed to be continuous. I mean, that is the assumption, right? This argument is clear because when delta z goes to zero, all these points z prime will be arbitrarily close to z, right? And then because the function is continuous, the difference between the function at this point and that point will go to zero, right? So that's the, so therefore you see uh, that, uh, uh, I mean, in fact, we have explicitly shown that the limit exists. I mean, delta z cancelled from the, for the first term, this gives you f of z. Second term is arbitrarily small, right? So therefore, we are saying that this limit, the uh, limit of this object, limit of f of z plus delta z minus f of z divided by delta z, limit delta z going to zero, is in fact, not only it exists, but we have even calculated what it is. It is simply f of z, small f of z, right? Okay. So first conclusion is capital F is analytic because uh, it, this derivative exists, right? And moreover, the small f is just a derivative of capital F. So I mean, so th this is this is what we call d capital F by dz if it exists, right? So we are saying d f d capital F by dz is equal to small f. But we have already seen that if a function is analytic, its derivative is also analytic. In fact, any number of derivatives you can take, and they are all analytic, right? So therefore, uh, since we have already proven capital F is analytic, so its derivative must be analytic. But its derivative is small f, so small f is analytic. This is the proof of the theorem. It's useful. I mean, in many some in many situations, in order to prove some theorems, uh, to to prove that some f is analytic, you know, uh, sometimes it's easier to prove that the integral over all the co closed contours is zero, right? And then then you can prove. Uh, then, so it's quite a useful theorem actually. Okay. Uh, is there any question on that? This. 
I mean, the logic is very clear, right? The fact that over all closed contours, uh, the integral vanishes, uh, that means that this, this, uh, this integral is in the independent of the path. This is the crucial point. If it depended on the path, there is no sense in, I mean, then this is going to be a function of not only z, but also the path. So it's not very useful, right? So because it's independent of the choice of the path, uh, this is only a function of z. And then you can, and then it's almost clear, because after all, this capital F is the integral of small f. So it's not surprising that the derivative of capital F is going to be small f. I mean, when you change this upper point, the limit, right? It's just going to be the integrand, f of small f of z. That's exactly what we're finding here. Okay. I think, yeah. All right, so, uh, so I mean, now uh, what we'll do is to, we'll try, uh, so now we'll try to, look at the Taylor expansion, etc., of the analytic functions. Hmm? But in order to do that, I need to say a few things about the uh, series, I mean, convergence of series, convergence of sequence, and so on. But I don't want to spend too much time on that, because that itself is a chapter by itself. You know? So I will just try to state the essential points, and then move on. Hmm? Um, so, okay, uh, I, can I erase all this now? It's is, is all clear to everyone, right? This, uh, if you have any questions, please ask. Eh? I mean, don't let, let it build. The doubts should not just keep building. No? Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, the sequ first of all, let's look at the sequence. A sequence is just uh, some, I mean, a sequence, let's say, A0, a, I mean, A1, A2, An, I mean, all the way up to, the, this could be a finite sequence or an infinite sequence. Okay. Uh, so, I will be mainly focusing on the infinite sequence. So, it will be infinite sequence. So, this is, so you have infinite number of these numbers are given. Then, uh, in general, of course, there is no reason why there should be any, uh, it sh there should be any limit to the sequence. Huh? But in some cases, it can happen that a n, in the limit n goes to infinity, converges to some number, say a. Huh? Okay. So what does it mean, this statement? This statement means that uh, the difference between a n and a should vanish in the limit n goes to infinity. right? Which means that if n is sufficiently large, right, the difference between these can be made arbitrarily small, right? That's the idea, right? Because in the limit, difference goes to zero, but of course, for a finite n, it's not necessarily zero. However, if you take large enough n, then the difference should become smaller and smaller, right? So this is uh, said in, this is written, I mean, this is stated in a way that for any epsilon, greater than zero, positive, I mean, but no matter how small, huh? uh, there exists some capital N, which of course will depend on epsilon in general, hmm? okay? such that A N minus A uh, is less than epsilon for all N greater than N epsilon. This is just to say what I mean, intuitively is clear, right? Intuitively, that's what we mean by, the, right? I mean, if you are saying that this uh, limit, in the limit, this goes to some number a, that means the difference between this a n and a should become smaller and smaller as n goes to, n becomes larger and larger, right? So that is the, exactly that statement is said here, that no matter how small you, it's epsilon you choose, there exists some integer such that beyond that, the difference is, all, uh, is less than epsilon. So that's the statement. Okay. This is for the sequence, and now you can also. Uh, there is a Cauchy criterion for. I mean, in fact, uh, sometimes you see it may not be possible to know what this number is, right? I mean, I mean, this kind of a test, this kind of a definition is applicable if you know what this limiting number is, right? 
but sometimes you may not know what that number is. Eh? So how would you check? I mean, you are only given these numbers. So how would you check whether this is, con this is convergent or not? So there is a Cauchy criterion. Cauchy criterion uh, for the convergence. Convergence of a sequence. Okay, and that is simply the statement that uh, for any for 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 any epsilon greater than 0, there exists again n which depends on epsilon such that a n minus a m is less than epsilon for all um, n and m greater than capital N. Okay. Again, intuitively it is clear, right? I mean, here we say that if, if we know this number where it which converges, which where we suspect it converges, we can just check that we say that a n minus a goes to uh, is less than epsilon, right? But of course, that also means the differences between a n and a m should go to zero, right? I mean, if the series converges some, uh, to some point, then the differences between them also must vanish, right? Because both, are, I mean, a n and a m both converge to that number a. So the difference must also vanish. So that is the statement. But the advantage with this is that you need not know what is the limiting number, right? You just once you know the, the what are the numbers appearing in the sequence, you just test. You can test it directly, without really knowing where it converges. So that's the is a convenient test. Okay. Um, <coughs> uh, then, okay, this was numbers but you can extend it to functions. After all, in the sequence, you may have functions rather than functions or some variable, right? Rather than just numbers. So you can just take the sequence of functions now. So you have, now let's say, let's call it, uh, so sequence some f1 of x. I mean, this could be a function of one variable or a complex variable, whatever, some argument. So this x is gener gener generic. Huh? Okay f1 of x, f2 of x, f3 of x, all the way. So the infinite sequence of functions. <coughs> of course, for a, a fixed x, if you pick a particular value of x, all these are numbers after all, right? Because this function just gives you a number for x. In that case, for you, you have the definition of this is the same definition. So for a given x, this is just a sequence of numbers, and the convergence is exactly defined in the same way. So what we are saying here is that, um, uh, uh, so, so exactly the same for any epsilon greater than zero, there exists an n that depends on epsilon, but it may also depend on x, you see? Because for different values of x, you have different sequences of numbers, right? So in general, it will also depend on x, right? So such that a n minus, so f n minus f n x, minus fx. So we say that this, uh, uh, this sequence converges to <coughs> converges to f of x, some f of x, right? If, if the following is true. Hmm? So fn x minus f of x, uh, uh, the absolute value is less than epsilon for all n greater than capital N, which depends on epsilon and x in general. I mean, this is to be expected, right? Because after all, for different x's, I get different sequences of numbers, right? Because these values are different, right? So in general, the, the capital N, uh, for a given epsilon, the capital N will depend on, on the sequence as well as the epsilon, right? So, but the sequence depends on x. So you should expect in general to be that that it will be depending on both epsilon and x. Uh, there is a slightly more refined uh, definition. This is, a, this is just convergence, but there is something called uh, uniform convergence. Uniform convergence. And this will be important. I mean, so 
important for us uh, in this chapter to be important. So uniform convergence. Huh? So what it means is that, I mean, so if, uh, uh, so again, the same definition, except that this capital N, if it does not depend on X, it only depends on epsilon, okay? So if one can, if we can choose, if we can find capital N depending only on epsilon, not, so, so not depending on X that is. Huh? X in some range, in some region uh, on X where X belongs to some region. Okay. In that case, you say that the, uh, the, sequ the sequence of the functions, sequence converges uniformly. Hmm? Uniformly in that region. Okay, there's a definition. <coughs> so what is the, uh, I think it's best to just illustrate a, an example of a situation where you have a sequence which converges, uh, but it does not converge uniformly. Okay, you can just so show this. So I just give an example. Example of uh, where, okay. So let, let's consider the following example. So f n x is simply n x divided by n square x square plus one. In the range, say x, x could be anything, but uh, let's just take x from zero to say one. Okay. I just choose some range, zero to one. So this, let's consider these functions. I mean, it is clear by inspection, inspection that n, uh, I mean, x is anywhere finite, okay, x and x square. But as n goes to infinity, uh, n square dominates capital. So first let's consider, so let's, let's take, uh, so first let's say x is not equal to zero. Hmm? Then we'll come to x when x equal to zero. I mean, this is between zero and one, including zero. Hmm? So suppose x is not equal to zero, then this number is not zero. But clearly, for large n, uh, uh, this is one. Of, this is n square. That is n. So this will dominate. So the whole thing will go to zero, right? So f n x will go to zero uh, when n goes to infinity. Square. However, uh, 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 and for x equal to zero, also it is z uh, zero because x equal to zero directly. This is zero. Right? In fact, every if, uh, every f n is zero in that. So also f n x goes to zero. I mean, it is in a trivial way because every element, every term is zero. So of course it goes to zero. So on the whole, what we are seeing, this sequence goes to just zero when x is in this range. But it's not uniform convergence for for the following reason. So let's let's choose some epsilon. So we want to. So we are saying that this uh, this uh, this sequence converges to some function f of x, where f of x is simply the zero function, right? Just, just zero. Okay. <coughs> so let's take an epsilon greater than zero and look at this equation f n x minus f of x and take the absolute value. Well, f of x is zero, so this is the same as f n x absolute value, <coughs> which is the same as n x over n square x square plus one, right? Because absolute value is the same as uh, this because it's anyway x is positive in this range. So, right, it's the same. And we want this to be less than epsilon, right? So we want to find some capital N. So some, for, uh, so if, yeah, such that this is less than epsilon. So let's solve that. So, let, so what it means is that uh, you can take this on the other side. So you get here n square x square plus one uh, pl uh, is uh, greater than n x over epsilon, <coughs> right? I just divide this by epsilon and multiply by n square x square plus one. These are all positive numbers, so inequality doesn't change. Okay, 
So now take it on the other side. So we are saying that this minus that is greater than zero, right? Now let's uh, so so we can look at the this is a quadratic quadratic polynomial, right? So this can be written as um, well. You can okay. So this is x. Uh, sorry, n. We want to sol solve for n. I mean, find find when it becomes zero, right? So this is the same as n. Uh, actually, let me also divide, take out the x square, x square, and this becomes x, correct? I just divide by x square. So I'm assuming here, of course, that x is greater than 0. I take it to be greater than 0. Okay, so uh, this is the same, the roots are what? If you look at the roots of this polynomial, uh, this is uh, n equal to uh, 1 over x. Um, so let's see, n equal to 1 over x, uh, no, not 1 over x, what is that? Um, so um, yeah, 1 over epsilon x, perhaps a factor of 2, right, plus minus square root of 1 over 4 epsilon square x square uh, minus 4 x, 4 over x square, uh, so, sorry, b square. So 1 over 2 outside, 1 over epsilon square x square minus 4 x square, 4 over x square, x over 4. Is that correct? Or 4 over x square, sorry, 4 over x square, correct. Yeah. I, I'm just using the say, standard quadratic equation, right? Uh, so, uh, so you see, so what we have is n, n should be, uh, so we are saying n should be, for this inequality to be true, we are saying n should be greater than uh, 1 over 2, uh, 1 over 2 epsilon x. You see, if epsilon x, if you take out epsilon x, this simply becomes 1 plus square root of uh, 1 minus 4 epsilon square. Right? You can take out epsilon square x square outside the square root. So when you take it out of the square root, it will just become epsilon x. So that combines with this. So you can take it out. Then you get 1 plus minus. Okay. So there are two possibilities, but in any case, each of them, so either plus or minus doesn't matter. Right? Uh, so you get this equation, this condition. Okay. But the important point here is that you see no matter what, so you choose some fixed epsilon greater than zero. Huh? But you see that uh, this n depends on x in a non-trivial way in the sense that in the limit x goes to zero, I mean x is little, little bit, I mean x is greater than zero. But now you start taking the limit, x becomes smaller and smaller. Then this n becomes larger and larger. You see, so this is exactly the situation uh, uh, where uh, this shows that it is not uniformly convergent. For uniformly convergent, you should be able to choose some n, which does not depend on x. But here we are seeing that there is no way I can do that because for small, smaller and smaller x, this n becomes larger and larger. Okay, so it's uh, not possible. Okay. I mean, in fact, another way to say it is the following: that uh, take, look at, evaluate this f of n at 1 over n, x equal to 1 over n, okay. This, you see, becomes independent of n. This just simply becomes 1 divided by 2. So this is simply uh, 1 half. You see, this doesn't go to 0 as n goes to infinity, right. We are saying that this sequence goes to 0 when n goes to infinity. But f n evaluated at 1 over n, is equal to half, you see, independent of n, okay. This is a, uh, <coughs> uh, okay, uh, another example I try to give uh, of this again. Uh, so choose the fn equal to, yeah. In this case, uh, epsilon is just the value Yeah, I mean, we say we choose some epsilon. We, uh, epsilon is, uh, I mean, whatever, uh, choose some epsilon. Oh no, epsilon is small. I mean, anyway, we want to check, uh, I mean, in these things when we say, uh, we choose some epsilon, but epsilon is very small, very, very small, right? I mean, that is the whole purpose of the checking the, uh, I mean, what do we mean by saying that? We want to check that something, some thing converges to some point, right? Some value. So the difference must be very small, right? So we are saying difference is epsilon. 
epsilon, epsilon is uh, 1 billionth, one, you know, choose some value, whatever, eh? but it's very small. Okay. I mean, if you are worried about this, uh, this thing, yeah. no, no, but epsilon is very, very small, I mean, you know. Um, I mean, you are not, I mean, when you say a sequence converges to some A, right, uh, we are looking at A n minus A uh, less than epsilon. I mean, there is no sense in saying epsilon equal to half because that doesn't tell you anything about the convergence, right? You want to show that this difference goes to zero in the limit and goes to infinity. Maybe if epsilon is equal to half, then there must be small. But that has no meaning because I mean, what will I, what will I prove by checking whether this is less, less than half? It will not prove you to anything, right? I mean, when you say that this series, this sequence converges, you want to check whether a n, a n minus a becomes zero or not, right? In the limit n goes to infinity. If you want to just, if you just check a n minus a is less than half, that doesn't tell you anything, right? I mean, just, just yeah. I mean, take the sequence of numbers. So suppose it's one over n. A n is one over n, right? Okay. We know that this is going to converge to zero. This little a will be zero, <coughs> but what if I had chosen a, a little a is equal to one fourth? Let's say, hmm? well, one, one over n minus one fourth. This will go to this will be less than whatever uh, one fourth, huh? or one half. Call, call it one half. But uh, this this doesn't tell you anything. It doesn't I mean this, this if this kind of a check will not t t tell you anything, right? <coughs> because this will say that this. Uh, I mean, this is, you cannot conclude from this that 1 over n is co converging to 1 half, right? To check the convergence, you want to take the epsilon to smaller and smaller and smaller, okay? But not exactly equal to 0. You want to say that no matter how small epsilon you choose, you can find some capital N such that the differences are less than epsilon, you know? This is the idea. So in this thing, we are choosing epsilon to be very, very small. So in fact, uh, so if, when you choose it to be very, very small, then you can even forget about that the, the, compared to 1. So this just becomes some 2 or something. Huh? So approximately this is 1 over epsilon x. Right. Uh, so yeah, the, the important point is that this x appearing here. Yeah. I mean, if, if, if the x was not there, there's no problem. This is what you would expect anyway, right? As epsilon becomes smaller and smaller, capital N should become larger and larger, right, in general. Because we are saying only the limit this becomes a, right? So if you say that the accuracy of your, the difference is very, very small, then you may have to go at sufficiently large in value in n to, to bring it the difference less than epsilon. So this part wouldn't be surprising if it was simply 1 over epsilon. But the problem is there is also x here. This is a problem. <coughs> okay. Uh, another example, you choose, uh, let's say, for example, mm, Let's say n x e to the minus n x square. This again you can uh, prove the similar reasoning, but once again you can see that um, uh, yeah, if you choose, for example, x equal to I mean this goes to zero, it's clear, right? This goes to zero uh, because exponential is suppressed for large n is suppressed exponentially. You know, the exponential suppression is, I mean, even though this is growing linearly, but this is an exponential suppression. So this will go to zero. Exponential suppression is much, much faster. Exponential, uh, uh, I mean, e to the n, e to the n uh, is, uh, grows much faster than any power of m, n to the power of any m, right? This is much, much bigger. This grows much, much, much more fast, exponential growth. So, so, of course, uh, uh, I mean, this is much larger than that. So, therefore, when you take the, when you divide by minus e to the minus n x square, this goes to zero much more rapidly than this increases. So, this goes to zero, okay? <coughs> right. But on the other hand, if you had evaluated f of n 1 over n at x equal to 1 over n, you see this becomes, uh, x 1 over n, so this becomes 1, whereas that becomes e to the power of minus 1 over n. <coughs> uh, 
correct, this value. And n goes to infinity, this becomes 0. So e to the power of 0 is 1. So this in the limit n goes to infinity is 1. So it's again the same situation as before. So in the previous example, we saw that it was not uniformly convergent and that you could see by the fact that fn evaluated at some particular values of x, which depends on n, was not going to 0. It was going to some 1 half. Here it is going to 1. So once again, you can I mean, try to go through the similar argument. You can prove again that there is, you cannot choose any n which is independent of x for a given epsilon. Okay. So it's again not uniformly convergent. Okay, uh, so this is one thing. Now the series, so series is a, I mean, you have a sum, I mean, F1, F1 plus F2 plus Fn, this series. So you say that this series converges, <coughs> this converges to some F, if, <coughs> in the, if, if this following is a true, take partial sums partial sums, let us say f m x f m, where m going from 1 up to n. So the first n terms I take, call that as some, is a partial sum. Of course, it depends on n, right? So I just take the partial sums. Okay. Then this, you see, uh, Sn, you take the limit now, n goes to infinity of the Sn, then you get the full sum, right? So the statement that this uh, this uh, thing converges to some this, this sum infinite sum converges to some particular f is the same statement that if you consider the sequence of essence, the infinite sequence of essence, right? Then that has that converges to f. It's the same statement, right? So if this converges to f, then you say that uh, the original series converges. To f, right? So basically, what I've done is I've converted the issue of convergence of series to issue to already the convergence of sequences, right? Because by taking partial sums, I converted the whole problem to sequences. Because now you consider the sequence of Sn. So you, you are considering the sequence S1, S2, etc. Hmm? Sn. So the, all the discussion that we did before follows through. Uh, the, the, the <coughs> so then this for I mean the whatever we set for sequence, it just goes through here directly. So in other words, you say the series converges if, uh, so it converges uh, if for every epsilon greater than 0, uh, there exists some n epsilon such that, such that uh, Sn minus f is less than epsilon for all n greater than epsilon. Okay. This is the this is the same same condition because I've just converted the problem of series to problem of sequence, right? So it is the same conditions. Okay. Uh, uh, once again, applying Cauchy criteria, because again, sometimes you may not know where it, where it converges to, right? So you, if you use a Cauchy criterion, then it's a statement that uh, there exists some capital N uh, such that Sn minus Sm is less than epsilon for all Nm uh, greater than capital N, right? That is a Cauchy criterion. But now, just use the fact that Sn and Sm are partial sums. And okay, without losing generality, suppose I take n greater than m, right? <coughs> then this is a partial sum of the first n terms. This is a partial sum of the first m terms. So the difference is simply the sum from, this is the same as sum f, uh, say, k, where k goes from m plus 1 up to m. So we are saying that this. Uh, this sum is less than epsilon. <coughs> so, 
for all for all n and m for all. There is, I mean, uh, once again, if you if you're not taking these guys to be function, if all these fn's were functions, then in general this will be a function of both epsilon and x. Right? If these are all functions, let's say, of some variables, then uh, once again, uh, this n can it will in general depend also on x. Right? So once again, you say if uh, this is this is uh, uniformly convergent. If you can choose an n without which does not depend on x, the same thing that we discussed said before. Hmm? Um, so, if we can choose n which depends only on epsilon, not on x, not on x, eh? then it's a uniformly convergent. The same thing that we said before. Uh, some of the examples maybe I should know. In fact, there's a one very important example is the. Um, well, maybe I should just write here. An example of a convergent series is the so-called geometric uh, series. Geometric series. So consider um, fn of x is simply equal to x to the power of n. Okay. Uh, this is uh, j this uh, this series is convergent, and it con for in a certain range of x, of course. This converges to so if you take the sum sum of x to the n, n going from say even zero to infinity. Hmm, this converges to one divided by one minus x. Hmm. So this is this is true. Provided if absolute value of x is less than 1. Actually, I can even consider complex numbers. It doesn't matter. So take it to be complex numbers. Okay. So this is less than 1. Okay. In that case, it's convergent. Uh, the, I think it's worthwhile to just uh, look at the proof of this statement. Let's try to see how we can prove it. Probably you already know this, but I mean, anyway, I'll just repeat this in case. <coughs> so let's consider the partial sum, okay? And so this is the same as uh, z to the k, k going from zero up to m, let's say. So I consider this partial sum. So what is that? This you can Im immediately work out in the following way. Let's m multiply this by z, so z times s n. This is, so actually let me write explicitly. So this is 1 plus z plus z square plus all the way up to z to the n, right? This is a partial sum. Now when I multiply by z, I'm going to get each term is multiplied z plus z square plus z cube plus all the way up to z to the n plus 1. I'm just multiplying each term by z, so you'll get that. Now take the difference between these two. Okay. So. So what we are what we are saying is that it's one minus z times s n, right? That is the difference between these two. So when you take the difference, you see this guy cancels from that. This cancels with this, and finally z to the n will cancel with the previous term. And what is left over is simply that and that. So you get here this equal to one minus z to the n plus one. Okay. So therefore s n I just divide by one minus z, assuming that z is not not equal to one. I'm going to be assuming this, z is not equal to 1. So if z is not equal to 1, I can divide. So you find Sn is 1 minus z to the n plus 1 uh, divided by 1 minus z. Okay. So let me write it like this. So it's 1 over 1 minus z minus z to the n plus 1 over 1 minus z. <coughs> so if you now take the difference between Sn and, uh, I mean, what I'm claiming is that this this converges to that, right? So which means Sn in the limit n goes to infinity converges to that. That's what we are claiming, right? So let's take the difference between this and this. So which means take Sn 
minus 1 over uh, 1 minus z and take the absolute value of that. So take this on the other side and take the absolute value of that. So you find this is the same as absolute value of z to the n plus 1 divided by absolute value of 1 minus z. Right? And this goes to 0 clearly in the limit as n goes to infinity because absolute value of z I'm assuming is less than 1. Right? So some number which is less than 1, if you take uh, larger and larger powers of that, it becomes smaller and smaller. Right? So this will go to 0 in the n going to infinity limit, provided this, 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 this is important. So if absolute value of z is less than 1. If absolute value of z is greater than 1, clearly this diverges right? for the same reason. A number which is greater than 1 and if you take larger and larger powers, it will blow up. Right? So this, uh, this, this series is divergent if absolute value of z is greater than 1. Okay? And uh, it's convergent when absolute value of z is less than, less than 1. And of course, from this already you see that z equal to 1, it diverges anyway. So the geometric series, this is called geometric series. It's <coughs> for, for absolute value z less than 1. Sorry? Sorry? Hey, sorry? When z equal to minus 1. No. No, uh, this expression itself, you see, is not, uh, it's, uh, it, it, I mean, this expression makes perfect sense, apart from z equal to 0. I mean, this expression makes sense also when z is greater than 1, right? But what I'm saying is that this series, I mean, what we have proven is that this is equal to that for z less than 1, right? But, uh, I mean, this itself has no meaning for z greater than 1. If, if you take z greater than 1, uh, this has no meaning. I mean, this is divergent. So this doesn't become that. You see. But this expression, yeah, is, is, is perfectly makes sense. In fact, we will. That's a very important point because uh, later on we'll discuss analytic continuation. Okay. Uh, the, so there it will be important. I mean, so I mean, let, let me come to that later. Huh? It's a very important concept, the analytic continuation. Uh, okay. Uh, so now what I wanted to do. Yeah, uh, one, uh, one uh, very convenient test is the so-called ratio test. Actually, there are many tests around. I mean, as I said, this is a whole chapter by itself. You know? But I will just uh, mention one test, uh, which is... Uh... Ah, one more thing I should say. Um, a series is called absolutely convergent. You see, in general, I mean, you can have... Okay, let, let me give an example, just one, just one example, before I go to the uh, ratio test. Um, Consider this uh, this series. Uh, let's say one uh, minus half plus one over three minus one over four. I mean, you know, alternating. So uh, one over n. So basically, one over n. Uh, n going from one to infinity, and you have minus one to the power of n plus one. Huh? So take consider this series. I mean, this is that that's that series. So it's alternating signs, and you have 1 minus half plus 1 third minus 1 fourth and so on. Uh, this series is convergent. Okay? However, if you have taken a different series with the absolute values of these terms, eh? so this will be convergent. Uh, I mean, I, I don't want to show to you why this is convergent, or should I? Hmm. Uh, sorry? It's conditionally convergent, right. On the other hand, if you take the absolute value, uh, this, I mean, to, it's, not, it's not immediately obvious that it is convergent. Huh? I, wanted to, I wanted to see if I could try to prove to you that. But uh, that will take me a bit farther away from the main point. So let's just assume that this is convergent. Huh? Although I don't know. It's, so, okay, this is convergent. Uh, but if you take the absolute values of individual terms, so in other words, absolute values of these guys are everything positive sign, right? This is the absolute value, which means uh, we are considering just 1 over n, some n equal to 1 to infinity. This is divergent. 
Okay. This is divergent. This blows up. Okay. Um, let me see how to. I mean, uh, one way to see this, uh, I mean, the fact that this is convergent, it's a bit taking me out of the main point. But uh, um, you see, consider, uh, let's look. So, what is uh, S1 is 1 for this, S2 is half, okay? Uh, S3 is uh, half plus one third, which is 5 over 6, right? Which is 5 over 6. Uh, S4, is 5 over 6 minus 1 fourth, okay, is something, uh, 24 minus 1, uh, you know, uh, so 24 minus 6, I don't know, some number, uh, okay, let's see, 5 over 6, or could you, can you, can someone say quickly what is that number? <laughs> you see, you take a LCM 24, so 20 minus 6, so 14 over 24. But I mean, it's clear that um, when you look at the the even guy, um, you see, even guy uh, comes with a minus sign, right? I mean, the last term. Is, is, compare the S3 and S4. S3 is the sum of these three. S4 is the sum of all that. But so S4 is the same as S3 minus one fourth, right? So a, S4 is going to be less than S3, right? But on the other hand, odd guy is going to be greater than. So S3 is greater than S2 because that is coming with a plus sign, right? So you have the following situation. Uh, you have every uh, odd guy, uh, 2n plus 1, is greater than S2n, right? Whereas um, uh, S2n is less than S2n minus 1, okay? This is the situation. And, uh, in, okay, so, so we have so so the way that I can write down the inequality equalities like this S one is uh, S one is uh, greater than of course uh, uh, I mean in fact uh, it will come like this let's see it will be in between S one and S two everything uh, S two you have um, how does it work let me see if you, you have these inequalities I mean you you can uh, what, what what will work out the following. Everything will be bounded between each of this. This will be bounded between S one and S two. Okay, that's what will come out to be. The, with this, uh, you know. <coughs> so how to write it? So S one is greater than S uh, uh, S two, of course. But here, uh, this will be uh, S three is greater than S two. Okay, uh, let's look at that. And then, but it will be. I think it will be like this. S four. And here you have S3, S5. I mean, you can convince yourself that this is the pattern. Okay. So you have this even sequence. If you look, just look at the even guys, okay. S2 is the minimum. Next one is S4, S6. They're all bigger in, in a successive way. Whereas in the odd case, if you look at the odd guys, uh, these are all, I mean, it's bounded by S1. S3 is smaller than S1, S5 is smaller than S3, etc. You can that, um, verify that. Huh? And there is a statement, uh, this again I have to say without proof, that if there is a sequence which is monotonic, monotonic, either it's monotonically increasing or monotonically decreasing, and it is bounded, then it is convergent. Hmm? So there's a statement here that if uh, a sequence is monotonic, And is bounded. Okay. Then it converges. Okay. Uh, it's not very difficult to convince yourself that this is the case. Huh? Uh, but okay, let me not try to prove that. Huh? I'll just say assume this. That, that, okay. There's a statement that if a sequence is monotonic, either which means either it's increasing or decreasing. The successive numbers are either increasing or decreasing, but also bounded, <coughs> right? And that's exactly the situation here. You see, if you look at the even guys, just consider these two different sequences, the even ones and the odd ones. The even sequence <coughs> is bounded again between, <coughs> uh, I mean, uh, the lower limit is S2 and upper limit is uh, anyway S1, 
right? They're, because they're all in between. So this is a monotonically increasing because S4 is greater than S2, S6 is greater than S4, is monotonically increasing sequence, but is bounded, so it has a limit, right? It converges to something. Similarly, if you look at the odd guys, this is monotonically decreasing and again bounded between S1 and S2, therefore that also converges. And finally, the only thing to check is that actually the two, convert, two limits are the same. The odd sequence and the even sequence are the same limit, which is again not very hard to see that. I mean, this is the way. So here you're looking at the upper limit, which will come somewhere, right? Whereas here you're looking at the lower limit because it's monotonically decreasing, and you can show that the difference is exactly, uh, I mean, it, it's the same thing. So upshot is that this converges to some finite value. Whereas this diverges, okay, uh, and this is, uh, but the, I mean, so it's not absolutely convergent. What I'm saying in this series is not absolutely convergent because absolutely convergent is that series where if you take the absolute values and sum them up, it converges. That is what is called absolutely convergent. Okay, so this is not absolutely convergent. The way to say that this is not, uh, this doesn't. Uh, one way to see this: this doesn't converge. That this is infinite is uh, you can do the following. Let's see. Let's try to. Um, so this is 1, 2, 3, 4. So we have 1. So that is here. I, I, I plot here. This is 1. Uh, this is uh, half. This point is half. This point is 1 third, etc. So this sum is the same as the as the sum over uh, this area, right? Uh, let's see, if I take this area, so this is one, right? This is one. Take this area, it's just one times one, it is one. Then you take this area, which is, this is half, half times one is, again, is half, the second term. Huh? Third one, take the one third point. So it is the area of this, this thing, right? Uh, this sum is the area of all of this under the, under this lines, okay? Um, maybe I should, uh, maybe I should have done it. Uh, let me shift it like this, sorry. Let me shift it like that. So I start from the one here. So let me do this one here. This is the one. And then you have a two, one half here, one third here, and so on. So if you take the sum of the, all of this, then you get, so the area of this plus area of that plus area of this is that sum, right? Okay? I mean, just uh, to all the way to infinity, right? This is the area. But, I mean, this area is, uh, instead of considering this area, consider the following area. Just uh, draw, uh, look at the, one, uh, the line 1 over x, hmm? the curve 1 over x. So plot 1 over x here. So starting from x equal to 1, up to infinity. Okay. So at x equal to 1, it is this point. 1 over x is 1. Here x equal to, this is a 1, 2, 3. Here x equal to 2, so 1 over x is 1 half, which is this. So you'll, you'll find a curve like this. Right? So now, I mean, so the, the, this, as I said, this sum is the sum of these areas, these areas of these rectangles. Clearly, that area is greater than the area under this curve, right? Because if you just consider this part of the area, that's clearly less than the full rectangle. This part of the area is less than that, and so on. So if I just compute the area under this curve, that area is going to be smaller than the, the, this sum, right? So we are saying that this is greater than, actually, the area under this curve, which is, of course, 1 over x dx from 1 to infinity, right? I mean, the area, the, so, right? But this is, uh, we know, the, the dx by x integral is log of x, right? So we are saying log of x evaluated between infinity and 1. At, at, I mean, log 1 is 0, that's fine. But uh, log infinity is infinity. So this is infinity. So we are saying this is this is greater than that. I mean, which means it's also infinite, right? So that is uh, one way to see that uh, this series is. Uh... 
On the other hand, if you had taken squares, I mean, so if you had taken this series, 1 over uh, 1 plus 1, 1 over 2 square plus 1 over 3 square, you know, in other words, 1 over n square, okay, this will be convergent. And you can again prove it something like this, okay. This time you try to find the lower bound. I mean, uh, here it was the, I mean, sorry, this is the lower bound, right. Uh, you, in order to prove that this is convergent, you uh, find an upper bound and show that the upper bound is finite, okay. Anyway, this, uh, this can be done. So the only the reason why I brought up this issue was just to show that, that there could be cases where a series may be convergent, but not absolutely convergent. So now let me just uh, go through this, uh, uh, this uh, I mean just, uh, just say one thing which is the, <coughs> which is the, the ratio test. Okay. So consider, um, so if you have uh, some, uh, some uh, series, uh, let us say Fn, uh, n going from 1 to infinity, okay, then uh, what you can look at is, um, uh, look at the ratio of the two successive. So uh, let us define Wn which is Fn plus 1 over Fn. Of course, in order to do this, I have to assume that these Fn's are, none of them is 0. Otherwise, this ratio will not. Huh? So I am going to assume that none of these Fn's are 0. Hmm? So you have uh, Fn plus 1 over Fn and take the absolute value of that. Hmm? So if this, so there are several cases. This, uh, if um, let us say this um, is this uh, for, for sufficiently large n, I mean for uh, so, so n greater than some capital N, let us say, hmm? uh, if this happens to be less than some number L, which is less than 1, there is one possibility. I mean, in other words, uh, so Wn for n sufficiently larger is uh, less than some L. Wn is an I defined as absolute value, which itself is less than 1. I mean, if, if these numbers are less than 1, basically, that is what I am saying. That is one possibility. In that case, it is absolutely convergent. Absolutely convergent. If it turns out, if, if this L is greater than, why, why am I saying this? Okay. If Wn is greater than 1 for large, I mean for n greater than some capital N, then it is divergent. And when this, uh, this Wn becomes in the limit becomes 1 as n goes to infinity, then you cannot say anything. I mean it may or may, be, may, not, may, or may not be convergent. Then you have to look at details. Hmm? Uh, but uh, at least in the case where it is uh, less than 1, you can immediately say, say that it is convergent. And it, it's not it's not difficult to prove. Actually, this just follows from the geometric series that we discussed before. Because uh, so beyond this, you see, I mean, so I can write this sum f of uh, say k k going from one to capital n. This is some finite quantity because it's a finite sum. This is something finite. Right? And then you look at all the remaining ones n plus one up to infinity f of k. Um, this I can do the following. I can just take out f k plus 1 as a common factor out, okay. And then you will get here, uh, first term is 1, uh, sorry, f of n plus 1, the common factor out. First term will be 1, second will be f n plus 2 divided by f n plus 1, right. I am taking out a common, I mean what is this? This object is nothing else, f n plus 1 plus f n plus 2 plus f n plus 3 and so on, right. So I am taking out f n plus 1 as a common factor. So first term is simply 1, second is this divided by f n plus 1, third is f n plus 3 divided by f n plus 1, but let me multiply and divide by n plus 2 and so on, okay. But what is the, but this is what I called W capital N plus 1, right. So this is the same as so f n plus 1 is outside and you get here 1 plus w n plus 1 plus w n plus 1 times w n plus 2, right, and so on. Okay. 
I mean, let's take the absolute value of this. So the absolute value of this, absolute value of the full sum is going to be less than uh, absolute value of the first part, fk, plus the absolute value of this thing, which in turn will be less than or equal to absolute values of, uh, of these terms, right? Okay. So now, this is okay anyway, finite. This is no problem this is a, because it's a finite sum, finite sum of finite numbers. So it's of course a finite quantity. Is the problem is here, right? So here I take so this is absolute value of f n plus one, and I get here one plus w n plus one, etc., etc. But each of these things is less than capital L, right? So again, I can since I'm interested in the upper bound, I can replace it by capital L's. Okay. So then this becomes a geometric series: one plus capital L plus capital L square, capital L cube, and so on, right? So the geometric series whose sum is simply 1 divided by 1 minus L. I mean that series is convergent provided L is less than 1, which we already saw. So this is the way to understand the, this ratio test. This is quite useful, I mean ratio test. In fact, using this ratio test, for example, you can show that the exponential series is convergent. Right? Actually, it's convergent for any finite x e to the power of x, let's say, is convergent for any finite x. Uh, whereas geometric series only convergent if the modulus was less than 1, but e to the, e to the z is convergent for any value of z, any finite value of z. I mean. So this again is a, is a trivial application of the ratio test. I mean, because, um, I mean, okay, let me just quickly mention this, uh, because you have e to the e to the z, remember, was defined as z to the n over factorial n plus 1, right? This was n equal to 0 to infinity. So if you take the nth guy and n plus 1th guy, and so fn plus 1 divided by fn, so it will be z to the n plus 1, sorry, this is factorial n, factorial n, uh, z to the n plus 1 over n plus 1 factorial divided by z to the n factorial n, and this is the same as z divided by n plus 1, right? So absolute value of this is simply the absolute value of z divided by n plus 1. So no matter how large you choose the z, I mean, you can take, you can define some capital. So let's say no matter how large the z is, choose the capital N to be bigger than, uh, bigger than absolute value of z. Then this, for small n greater than capital N, this is clearly less than 1, right? So it's, uh, and then you use this ratio test tells you that that is, this is convergent. Okay. Uh, so now, uh, let me just, uh, okay, this was just a very brief, uh, I mean, it, to do a proper job, it, uh, one would need to spend a couple of lectures on this. It's a, I mean, it's an important subject in itself, I don't know. But maybe if I want to move in this, I will proceed. Um, to, so I have got 15 minutes. Okay. Um, you see, in general, I mean, so suppose that uh, you have a, uh, see, let's see, I don't. Um, so suppose you, you have uh, this, uh, this sum series, let's say f, f n z, and going from 1 to infinity, uh, say this converges, converges, uh, this, this is equal to some f of z. Yeah? So it, it, this converges and it's equal to some f of z. In, in general, it may not be, it may not be happen, I mean, so now suppose I want to do some operations on this, like integrate. Well, by, by definition, the integral of fz dz is going to be the same as integral dz of this whole thing, right? This is, of course, true. However, you can ask the following question. Could I have exchanged these two operations? No? Meaning, first do the integral of the individual terms and then sum it up. Hmm? That is not always possible. So the question you are asking is, is this equal to uh, integral, uh, sorry, uh, sum n equal to 1 to infinity of the integral f and z dz. Okay. 
This is not always true. But what you can show is that if this series is uniformly convergent, then you can exchange the limits. Okay? So, what, so the statement is in general not true. In general, it is not true. In general, this, they don't commute. These two operations don't commute. Uh, I mean, the integral and sum don't commute in general. But if the if the but if it is if the series is uniformly convergent, but if it is uniformly convergent, you can then it commutes. Then it commutes. Then these two operations commute. This is an important point. I, let me just give an example of this. I mean, to illustrate that um, uh, when it is not uniformly convergent, this, uh, I mean, the, the two operations may not commute, right? <coughs> I mean, this is this I, I'm writing in the, in, the, in the sense of the series, but of course, the same thing also goes to the, for the sequence. Because after all, the series is the same as sequence, right? By looking at the partial sums, your essence, right? Then uh, those are, that's the same as sequence. So in other words, also for sequence, this is a fact. That if you take some sequence of essence, uh, and, and it say sub in the n going to infinity limit, suppose it, it is converges to something, you can ask the same question. Uh, if I take the integral of f of z, is it the same as uh, taking the integral of individual terms and then take the this, uh, consider the sequence of which you obtain by taking the integrals? These are some numbers, right? And uh, is this the same? That's a question mark, hmm? and in general, this is not true. Okay, to just give you an example, the, you remember I gave you one example which was not uniformly convergent, which was uh, let's say this n x e to the minus n x squared. Right? This was not uniformly convergent, even though uh, this this uh, sequence uh, was going to zero function, right? Zero function, null function. I mean zero function. It's going to basically zero. Hmm? As you can see, with, because n, n dominates, right? Uh, but it's not uh, so. Let's say that it's, uh, look at the ra range x is between zero and uh, something, say one or something like that. Huh? Let's choose this. Now, uh, I mean integral of so this f is zero. Huh? Integral of zero in that range, of course, is zero, right? But let's look at the in integral of individual terms and see what is the sequence. What what do you get? Hmm? So if you want to do this integral nx e to the minus nx squared dx, say between 0 and 1. <coughs> but now I can absorb n, you see. Uh, let's redefine, after all this integration, I can redefine x equal to 1 over root n y. Okay. Then x square is 1 over n times y square. So this n cancels. This is n. And here you have x dx also will pick up a 1 over root n, 1 over root n, which may, uh, so it becomes 1 over n, which cancels with that. So this simply becomes 0 to 1 uh, y dy e to the minus y square, which is certainly not 0. It's some number, whatever, some number, non-zero number, right? So you see that this is, for every n, this integral is some fixed number. So the limit of that will be that number. So you see the two operations don't commute here, you see. Huh? So th that's why, I mean, uh, so uniform convergence is an important thing because then you are guaranteed, you can commute, okay, the two operations. So let's see how we can prove that. Uh, so, so let's assume that Fn uh, this series, <coughs> uh, fn n equal to zero, n equal to one to infinity, what, uh, fn z uh, equal to uh, it, it converges uniformly to f of z. I mean this. Or let's do the following. Let's first define uh, partial sums okay, equal to one to n. So this is the partial sum, and we are saying that the sequence s n z uh, converges to some function f of z uniformly, 
uniformly in some region. I mean, when, when Z is in some region. It may not happen everywhere, but in some region. So, there are every link of integration in, uh, between 0 and uh, R? Ah, so, let's make it infinity. Let's make it infinity. That's easier. Yeah. Yeah, let's do that to 0 to infinity. Huh? Then it doesn't matter. Yeah, correct. Yeah, you're right. If, you, if I take finite, then it will be. 1 over root n. But if it is yeah, 0 to infinity, then it becomes independent, right? Yeah. I mean, even if x is la larger and larger, in fact, the suppression is even, uh, even stronger. No? So this is still true that this goes to 0 in the entire thing. <coughs> yeah. <coughs> yeah, you're right. I mean, it should have been 1 over root n if, if, the, if the range was finite. Yeah. Right. So, so now we want to say, we want to check. Uh, so we want to prove that if it is uniformly convergent, then uh, the integral. Uh, so of course this is true that uh, if I take the uh, first the limit n going to infinity of s s n of z and integrate that of course by definition is the integral of f of z, right? Integral dz. This is by definition the integral dz f of z because this limit is what is, is f, f of z. But now we are asking the question, is it the same as the limit? As first, first do the integral and then take the limit. That's the same as Okay, this is what we want to do. Well, to do this, let's take the difference between this and that. I mean, we want, we want to check whether this is equal to that, right? This is a question mark here. So let's take the difference. So you have here dz and f of z. Uh, I mean, so I take the limit and goes to infinity of f z minus s n z. I'm just taking. I take this on the other side. Okay. So you just get in d z integral f z minus s n z. <coughs> now use the Darboux inequality. Uh, Darboux inequality says that this is going to be less than or equal to, so I take the absolute value of this. Huh? So I take the absolute value of uh, this quantity and uh, take the, uh, so. so this B is the same as less than or equal to the length of the, length of the, this path, whatever the path is, huh? okay. times the maximum value of the difference, f of z minus uh, s and z. And the, the limit n goes to infinity. N goes to infinity. Okay. Now the important point, I mean, where this this uh, so this is the maximum value. So it's given some path, let's say. So we are saying that it's this is the maximum value of this when you when you go from point to point along the path. <coughs> okay. But now the point is that when it is uniformly convergent, you see you can make this arbitrarily small, right? independent of z. So, the, so that, that, that then, you know, otherwise you couldn't have done this, right? Because if the difference uh, was not going to be, I mean, uh, so what we are saying is this, I can make it for n greater than some capital N, which depends only on epsilon, I can make this arbitrarily small, right? However, if it was not uniformly convergent, we were not guaranteed, right? Because for, then it, if it was not uniformly convergent, this will be a function of z also. No? Then it's not, you cannot go through this argument then. Okay? However, when it is uniformly convergent, this is a purely a function of epsilon. So if once you take n to be greater than this capital N, which does not depend on z, this becomes smaller and smaller. So it becomes, you know, you can make it arbitrarily small. So that's therefore, therefore this is indeed zero. This limit is indeed zero. Which means the two operations can be commuted. They commute. That's an important point. Okay. So now uh, let me just uh, do. So that that is where the uniform convergence is so useful. You see, because these operations you can uh, exchange, which makes the life very easy, much easier. So, for example, as a consequence of this, you can immediately prove the following. I mean, this statement was true for general function. It, I have not assumed analyticity or anything like that. I am not assuming that this analytic functions. Okay? 
This is general statement. Actually, it's not just for a complex variable. It could be many. It could be in any dimension. It doesn't matter. It's not important. But now let's specialize to analytic. So suppose I have, I have a, uh, uh, this f f f f n z's are say analytic. Okay. For I mean for all n. Right. This this f f f n's which are appearing there. Suppose now they are analytic. And furthermore, that this uh, say this uh, this sum, so of course this means the sum k equal to one to n of f k z, which is what we call S n of z, is also analytic. Right? Because this is a finite sum. If if, if your individual objects are analytic, so sums of analytic functions are also analytic, right? Because each term is differentiable. Some of these terms are also differentiable, right? So long as we talk about finite sums, because there could be some subtleties if you have take, if you take infinite sums, right? Um, yeah. Uh, so now, so the question is, uh, this function, so in the limit s and z, uh, and going to infinity, suppose it limit exists, let's call that function f of z. Question is, is it analytic or not? Hmm? This is what we are going to ask. So the question is, is it analytic? Is this analytic? It's not at all obvious. Eh? I mean, for the real functions, you can uh, find examples where even though the individual terms in the in, uh, series or sequence is uh, continuous functions, the limiting function is not even continuous. Okay? You can find examples of that. So this is not, not at all guaranteed. Okay? That, uh, uh, so even, even continuity is uh, lost sometimes. I mean, in, you can find examples where even continuity is lost. So of course, differentiability is lost. Now we are talking about analyticity, which is much stronger than just differentiability. Right? So this is all not at all clear that this will be the case. However, this is where you can use Morera theorem. So of course, again, we are saying that this is, uh, we are again assuming it's uniform convergence. It's uniformly convergent. Okay. So if it is uniformly convergent, then we will try to prove that this is analytic. This is going to be analytic. And the argument is the same that because, uh, so let's take uh, integrals of, of a, uh, by, uh, I mean, from uh, Morera's theorem, I can, prove that f of z is analytic if for every closed contour, if this integral is 0, right? So let's try that. Let's see if we can prove that that is 0 for every closed contour. So let's see what is this. This is, uh, so what is this thing? That's what we are asking. But you know, we have already, sh sh uh, I mean, for when it's uniformly convergent, I can exchange these two limits. I mean, the limit and the integral I, I can exchange, right? So this is the same as limit n going to infinity of, uh, integral s n z dz over this closed contours. Right? This is where I am using the uniform convergence. Otherwise, this will not be necessarily true. Hmm? So uniform convergence I have used. And now use the fact that this uh, s n z are analytic. So by Cauchy theorem, this is 0. Right? I mean, each term is 0. For each n, it is 0. So of course, limit n goes to infinity is also 0. This is 0. By Cauchy theorem, this is equal to zero. So therefore, the limit is also zero. So we have proven that for uniform convergence series, uh, integral of f of z is zero for any closed curve. Right? Therefore, by Morera theorem, f of z is analytic. So a very strong statement. I mean, okay. This is certainly not true, true for real functions. Eh? I mean, uh, you can easily find examples where you know things don't work. Okay. 
Good. So, what else uh, I can say now? In fact, we can say one more uh, is not only so the first statement is F0 is analytic. You can prove one more thing and you can also ask okay, if it is analytic, what is its differential? I mean, the, what it says analytic means is, uh, is differentiable, right? So, the derivative exists. So, you can ask what is the derivative, okay? But uh, that, so the uh, question is, is the derivative the limit of the, the, the sequence obtained by taking derivatives of Sn? That is you can ask. Okay. And uh, <coughs> so, this is uh, one can again prove it in the same way um, because again the derivative can be written again in terms of integrals, right? Because after all, we are saying if you take S n z divided by z minus uh, say some z naught square, okay, or let us call it uh, z prime, z prime minus z square. Hmm? and integrate this expression uh, over some closed contour which encircles z. So, this is some closed contour uh, that encircles which encircles z. Okay. Then this is nothing else but dsn by dz. Right? This we, we saw you remember that from the last time. Right? So, it is the same thing then because uh, after all, I mean, this again is you are doing integral, right? You have S n z prime. So, look at the situation. We have limit n goes to infinity uh, S n z prime is equal to what we call f of z prime, right? That is the, that is where the limit and it is uniform convergence. So, of course, it is also I can just multiply by anything both sides. This is also true and it is also uniform convergence because this is just some, something which I am multiplying. Okay, so uniform convergence there. So, once again you can integrate both sides on, on this closed contour which contains z which includes z and circle z and exchange the limit. Right? So, this comes here. So, this side is simply limit n goes to infinity of uh, d s n over d z at z and the other side is uh, d f by d z at z. So, it is yeah, I think maybe I should know. Okay, I think we are basically ready to start talking about the Taylor expansion, but maybe I can do that uh, tomorrow.